<laughs> this is just the basic. Thanks for reminding me. And this event will be recorded, of course. So Solidify, we are partners to Microsoft and GitHub and have been partners with Microsoft for years and GitHub for just one year. And we are investing heavily in GitHub because we think it's the future when it comes to development and we really love the platform. And we need to, we want to share this with you. So next slide, please. These are the events we have done so far. We started up with code collaboration, some basic stuff with GitHub before summer. We also did GitHub Actions, working agile with GitHub, and we have securing your workflows today, where Mihai is going to tell you about working with all the nice security features we have in GitHub. And we have other events planned, and um, next two weeks, Matthias is going to talk about code spaces, which is a real, real cool, cool, cool feature. And we have other plans as well, but if you have topics you'd like to hear from us, we'll be happy to listen to you guys and talk about them. Or if you, one of you maybe wants to talk as well, that would be nice. Next slide, please. Mihai, over to you. Yes, uh, my name is Mihai Bors. I'm a consultant at Solidify. I've been working as a software engineer since 2008. So uh, the agenda for today. Uh, we will start with some basic concept, concepts of uh, security and DevSecOps. The focus of today's presentation will be on securing the repository, and we will do a, We will also look at some tools that will help us uh, achieve this. Each concept will be backed uh, by a demo. Uh, since the time is short, I have prepared the demos in advance to avoid unnecessary waits. Also, there are a few steps of uh, installations. Uh, which always tend to go wrong if done live. Uh, but I will, of course, explain the installation steps as well. Uh, this session should be interactive, so feel free to post questions in the chat, uh, and we will try to answer them as good as possible. So uh, let's get started. Um, in a traditional setup, uh, we had sec uh, security teams that uh, were responsible for ensuring that the code was secure um, and the infrastructure. Meanwhile, we had auditors that made sure that the rules are being followed. This approach, however, increased this time to market um, and the pressure of fast deliveries from uh, the business side requires that security and engineering teams to work to come closer together. This is where uh, DevSecOps comes in place. Uh, to reduce this gap, DevSecOps, DevSecOps uses a similar approach that we used before, for example, for uh, quality assurance and operations, and that is shift left. Um, so the purpose and intent of DevSecOps is to build uh, build on the mindset that everyone is uh, responsible for security. Um, the goal is to safety distribute security decisions to the teams without sacrificing the required level of safety. This does not this does not mean that the security teams will be obsolete. It means only that they will have other responsibilities, such as, for example, setting up policies, guidelines. Uh, also, today, most security test tools are designed to, to make it this easy to behave well in continuous integration and continuous delivery. So, uh, the benefits of DevSecOps are uh, observability. This refers to how observable the application delivery process is, what happens in the pipeline. Do we know what is happening from the moment we write a user story through all the build, the deploy, and manage stages? Uh, traceability, are we able to understand which feature user stories are being deployed or running in a specific environment? Can we prove this? Confidence, it's all about building uh, a trust between the business and development. What is being delivered, it was, was stated in the beginning of the pipeline or in the user story. Uh, compliance, uh, this is an important in specific industries such as banking, healthcare, insurance, and so on. Uh, we need to have compliance integrated in the pipelines and we should do this as soon as possible. 
So security needs to be added to all um, stages of our application delivery process, as well as in the business processes. We will not go through all the stages today, but rather focus more on the code section and look at some tools that will help us with discovering flaws. I hope that in the future we will be able to hold similar sessions in which we will cover other stages. Um, if you look at this diagram, note that uh, there must be feedback from each and every stage. Um, the earlier we get the feedback, the less costly taking action will be. Uh, we try to shift the steps in the stages towards left as much as possible and of course where it makes sense. Uh, at team level, the aim is to drive a security uh, culture so that security becomes part of uh, daily work. Do we have any questions until now? No questions so far. OK, so let's continue. So uh, working with code, um, test-driven development, behavior de de development, uh, to shift left automated testing and make sure that there is confidence, compliance with the increment being made. Uh, we can even use STDD uh, to include security automated tests based on security related acceptance criteria. For example, if you're using abuser stories. Uh, an example of a, an abuser story is, for example, as an authenticated customer, I see how my invoice URL looks like, and I'm wondering what happens if I change the invoice, invoice number in the URL. Uh, paired programming should be used to enhance collaborations uh, and four eyes principle, um, depend on both. Uh, to automate the upgrading of um, libraries through automated pull requests. Uh, everything that can be should be code, pipelines, infrastructure, tests, um, configuration and artifacts. Treating infrastructure provisioning and configuration as a software problem and following the software engineering practices like version control, um, PR code reviews, refactoring, static code analysis, automated testing, continuous integration, and deploying the changes to the same kind of continuous delivery pipelines, make configuration changes repeatable, auditable, and safer. In other words, by applying, um, by having everything as code, we gain transparency, auditing, confidence, and compliance. Um, no secrets in the repositories. Um, they should be enforced by scanning. Uh, most applications need some sort of uh, secrets or keys to communicate with other services and resources. These secrets tend to get spread across workflows, running containers, Kubernetes secrets, and in some cases in the source control. Um, a key management uh, service should be used to centralize all the secrets for a specific application and environment into a single uh, location. Um, by doing this, we gain auditing, traceability, and also control over our secrets. Um, it is important to require pull requests and the standard set of policies on all, on all uh, merges into the main branch. This can be done by uh, using uh, branch policies or rules. The following are good practices and checks to enable. Uh, we need at least one reviewer. Uh, do not allow requesters to appro approve their own uh, changes since it will violate the four eyes principle. Check for uh, comment resolutions. All, all comments should be resolved. Um, we need to add build validation and static code analysis. Um, we, can, we should scan uh, third party packages for vulnerabilities um, and also credential scanning. Even if the team committed not to have codes, uh, secrets in code, accidents might happen and the pull request reviewer might miss it. 
Um, enable scanning even of images for vulnerabilities. It is recommended to, to even scan Docker images for vulnerabilities and organizational policies. For example, uh, don't run as root, don't expose non-standard non ports. And there are a few tools that can be used like Anchor, OpenScape, Clear. Uh, there are also some commercial tools like Twistlock, Flowcheck, Black, uh, Duck Hub. Um, pull requests uh, also slows down the flow of the code into the main branch. So you need to find a balance on how many checks you want to, to enable for a pull request. Um, also, teams need to prioritize reviewing all pull requests to maintain a good flow. Maybe you can add some uh, notification when a pull request is created. So let's take a look how to configure pull requests um, policies in GitHub. So to configure um, pull request policies, um, you do it under the settings tab, branches, and you can add new rules. Uh, I already configured mine, but we can go through the, the settings that I enabled. So we need to check required pull request review before merging. Uh, we can choose how many reviewers we want to, to have. Um, we should dismiss any approvals if there were commits afterwards. Uh, we should require some status checks uh, before merging, and in my case, I enabled uh, like uh, code QL analysis, white source um, bolt security checks, and some um, secret scanning. Um, obviously, the changes uh, should be saved. So as soon as as we create a pull request, for example, I created the pull request that pushes in some insecure code. And we will see that the checks run and we get a, a status, a quick status here, like which ones went through and which ones have failed. Um, any questions until now? No questions so far. Okay, so let's continue then. Um, with the next topic. So for for um, third pack package dependencies, I have used White Source Bolt. Um, White Source, uh, it's a security and license compilation management platform. Um, from what I understood, it started a partnership with GitHub. So uh, I think more GitHub security features like dependency scans, license composition, and a lot more will come soon. Uh, white source bolt is available on, on uh, GitHub market. Um, and what it does, it, it scans your repository. Um, it creates re, uh, issues in real time. Um, scans active pull request. And in case of a pull request, you will get a, a report, a vulnerability report. So let's take a look at how um, White Source Bolt um, works. So to, to enable um, White Source Bolt, uh, you have to install it first, and you can find it on the market, on the marketplace, and it's, it's on the first page, it's White Source Bolt. It's already installed um, in our organization, in Solidify's organizations. Um, this tool is not free. You have five scans per day for a repository, but you can obviously buy more. Uh, to enable, um, Y-Source uh, Bolt must be then configured uh, for your repo. This is done 
from the installed GitHub uh, apps under the organization settings. So if we go to Solidify settings and um, so we can configure uh, white source bolt. And we can choose which uh, repositories we want to enable it for. So I chose my um, Fitbit API demo. After the activation, a pull request containing the white source bolt configuration file is created. Um, another important thing when it comes to uh, white source bolt is that you need to enable issues um, on your uh, repository. This is done under settings. Um, so you have to enable it. Um, the, um, uh, after the pull request is merged, then uh, um, wild source bolt will start a scan and create issues for the encounter vulnerabilities. But let's take first a look at how the configuration file looks like. So it's pretty simple. Um, we, this means what should happen. For example, if a pull request, if you try to add a new package with vulnerabilities, it should uh, fail the checks. Um, you can choose the security level. So for example, it will create now uh, issues for all the vulnerabilities security levels, for example, from low and above. You can disable the creation of issues by setting here uh, none. So after the scan, after I scan this repository, um, I use this Fitbit API demo just because it has some old spring dependencies that happen to have some vulnerabilities. Um, it's nothing wrong with the code, uh, so it's just because it was it has some old dependencies with vulnerabilities. So if we look at how the created issues look like, it founded like 91 issues in this uh, repository. So if we we can take a look at you know, the issues in here, so we can uh, get some vulnerability details. Um, And we can see the attack complexity, for example, the impact. Um, and we get even suggestions. Hmm. When we create a pull request, for example, I created a pull request uh, with a package um, upgrade. Um, White source bolt won't uh, run scans if you did, don't change um, if you don't make changes in a dependency manifest file from a package ecosystem. In my case, it's uh, Maven. So, for example, I up updated this Angular JS um, dependencies, and if we look at our um, uh, status for white source bolt. Uh, we see that it's it complains that it, it says that we have uh, fixed the vulnerability. Here is the CV number for it. And we can see that the issue is um, present in here as well. Which was a medium. Hmm? Any questions until now? No questions so far. OK. Are you, going, are you going to talk a bit about the Pandabot as well, I guess? Or? Yes, uh, yeah. soon. Yeah, thank you. Mm, and uh, OK, so if there are no questions, let's continue. Well, another interesting feature is the Dependabot uh, that creates automatic pull requests to keep your dependencies secure and up to date. 
Um, you can review. Uh, so as soon as you activate uh, depend, uh, Dependabot, it will scan your repository and will create automatic pull requests. So you can review them and then choose to merge them. Um, it's important to, to note that uh, dependency updates can, uh, can affect your functionality. So it's important to have a, a test suite that you can that can be trusted. Um, so it, you have to enable other checks, like for example, you should build at least before, because um, there might be breaking changes, and you should also run your tests to make sure that your application works as intended. So um, let's take a look at how. Um, how to configure Dependabot. Um, as uh, we did with uh, White Source Bolt, uh, you have to install it. Uh, from the um, marketplace um, and uh, after you install it, then again under the company settings and installed applications. You can allow Dependabot to scan different uh, repositories. Um, Dependabot uses a configuration file. So as soon as you activate it, you can create a um, YAML file, a configuration file, and you can choose when to, to scan, how often, and how many pull requests. You for example, for this repository, I got a lot of pull requests, but you can limit them to, for example, two, for example. So you shouldn't open more than two pull requests so that you have time to, to analyze them and merge them into the into your branch. Uh, you configure also the package ecosystem. Um, for example, uh, I run my uh, my um, Dependabot run this morning and created some some uh, pull requests for me to update, for example, jQuery to, for example, to update uh, Spring Boot. And we can see that this is uh, this breaks some checks, so that's why it's good to have additional checks, not only dependable, because then you will um, you can um, have a, a main branch that is not building. Um, any questions until now regarding dependable? None so far. You can even log in on their uh, page and look at the repositories that you. Um, that you have activated Dependabot for. Uh, if there are no any questions regarding Dependabot, then I guess we can continue. So another interesting feature is code scanning. Uh, code scanning uh, feature in GitHub is uh, like uh, CodeQL as a service. Um, CodeQL is a query-based semantic uh, code engine, and um, it is the result of 13 years of research. So what's interesting with CodeQL is that it, it treats code as data, allowing you to find potential vulnerabilities in your code uh, with greater confidence than traditional static analyzers. It creates a database of facts about your code, um, provides an expressive declarative query language to identify patterns into your code. Uh, the most important thing is that it's, uh, it is community driven and GitHub language experts and security research create queries um, um, used for code scanning. Um, um, uh, code QL um, uh, queries have a quite interesting uh, syntax. For example, if we look at um, 
at this uh, image. I posted a query that uh, looks at all catch clauses to see if they have if they have an empty an empty block or if uh, if not, then it checks also that uh, the, the block shouldn't have only one comment. Uh, so this is how, you, how, you, how the, the queries looks like. You don't have to write your own queries, obvious. Um, there are a few um, that you can already use. Um, it's mainly if you want to write your own to detect some common patterns into your uh, repository. Uh, if you choose to write your own queries, uh, you can. Uh, there is an um, uh, Visual Code extensions that extension that could help to get some uh, intelligence. Okay, so so let's look at uh, a demo: how to activate code scanning and how the how it looks like. So code scanning um, can be activated under the security tab of the repo. Um, yeah, code scanning is in beta, right, at the moment? So yes, it's in, the, in beta and, and there is a waiting list, so you have to sign up. That's why we're using the Solidify, because it's activated in on our um, organization. So for example, I, I activated uh, code QL scanning uh, there are a few more uh, codes uh, scannings like anchor for container vulnerabilities. But uh, let's look at how this one looks like. So when you activate it, you create a pull request. Uh, it, it creates a pull request for you, or you can choose to create a pull request or commit direct into the, the master. Um, I created my own. Uh, I added a configurations a configuration file to make it easy to configure it and add to make it more easy to add and remove scans. So I have my code um, code QL config file. So I have um, extended security and security and quality checks enabled. Um, so, for example, um, the current code, uh, the current, the, the main branch doesn't really have any any code issues right now. In case I would have some um, code issues, they will show up under the security uh, and the code scanning alerts. Um, I pushed a pull request yesterday, for example, with some uh, flaws in it. So, if you look at file changes. For example, I pushed a, uh, a variable that I'm not really using it. Um, so I get the notification. I looked over the, the entire array length. Uh, so, so I get a an, um, notification here that it's array out of bounds. Um, So in the checks, we, it looks like this. For example, it builds my code and generates the database, and then it runs the code QL scannings. Uh, you can even see it in here in the um, code. Uh, we see that there are different levels. For example, this is just a note. Uh, for example, it's not it's just a variable that I'm not using, but this one could cause issues. Uh, any questions about code QL? Well, I have a thought actually. I use a tool called SonarCube quite a lot, and it seems to be doing quite the same stuff. But this is built in in GitHub. I really like that. Do you know any difference between SonarCube and code QL? Or no code scanning, the GitHub code scanning. Um, yes. Um, what's nice with um, CodeQL is that you can um, obviously write your own uh, queries 
to detect your own. Um, if, if you want to have some different patterns in your code. Um, another interesting uh, is that it's driven by community and there's a lot of contributors, language experts and security research that write queries. We can even um, take a look at the um, uh, available, uh, for example, uh, CodeQL um, Uh, for example, the, the queries that are available for, for the Java are in, uh, in Java, obvious. Um, QL, source. There should be a code uh, QL suit. And here we have a few a few code suites. We, for example, we enable this one for hours and uh, this one. But there are a few others like uh, Java Full, so you you can use whatever. And there are a lot of contributors that update and maintains this to reduce the false positives and to detect uh, more flaws. Hmm? Any other questions? Not at the moment. OK, so uh, let's continue then. Um, another important check that we need to do in the uh, in the uh, pull request, I think, is to scan for, uh, for secrets. Um, currently, there is nothing built in in uh, github but i'm pretty sure that it's coming soon uh, but there are a lot on uh, uh, code sc uh, secret scanning uh, tools on the market there are even some that recycle your keys for example so let's look at the demo um, We have a question here that can you use code QL for secret scanning? I guess that would be a possibility if you have a query that does it. Yes, you can absolutely check, but um, code QL doesn't really have any any built-in functionality to detect that it's it's a secret or it's a key, from what I know. Okay, thanks. So, um, for example, the the, the uh, key scanning tool that I used I use is um, it's uh, called pretty intuitively like uh, secret scan. I encourage everyone to look at some tools that are under the security tab. There are pretty good ones, for example, OWASP Zap uh, for dust testing. Um, so the one that I use is and doesn't really require an installation. It's just a YAML file. So I added this YAML file into my um, repository under the GitHub workflows and um, secret scanning. Um, I'm using always master, but to get the latest changes. So uh, in the pull request that I created um, uh, the other day, I, um, I also pushed a unused variable that happens to contain, uh, for example, a key to, to an um, Azure um, um, storage account. Um, I already recycled this key, so it doesn't help if you take uh, screenshots. Uh, so if we look at how this uh, scanner work, works uh, in my pull request, okay. 
for example, it's the first scan that I enabled and we see that it fails. And we can see that it detected that we had a, a secret in our code, that we pushed the secret in our code. And the probabilities that it's a secret are pretty high. I think you should get a score or high entropy. Yes, any questions until now? Okay, I guess not. So let's... Uh, yes, there was one question, but we answered that. We got a question about the language of CodeQL support, and it was... I mean, I wrote it, the answer in the chat there, so we okay. covered that. Uh, the, the, the languages that are supported now are the... Um, uh, we, yes. we have it we have it in the chat so that's fine okay uh, good so let's continue then um, so now we will look at some some um, features uh, that are available in github uh, these features are are mostly intended to be used by maintainers um, so for example the security advisories uh, security policies, sorry. Um, it is a, um, for example, an industry. It's a, it's a convention for the industry. And it's mostly intended for the maintainers. Um, you, by configuring um, security policy, the maintainer informs researchers or others that, uh, uh, that it they, it informs how to responsible responsibly report the encounter issue so that uh, no one can uh, take advantage of this vulnerability so uh, when someone creates a issue into your repository they will see a link to your project security policy there is also the possibility to create a default security policy for a user or an organization by, example, by adding, for example, a uh, security MD under the uh, .github uh, repository. Um, so um, let's take a look at how to, to activate this feature or how to work with it. So yeah, under the security, security policies, there is no one, no, none yet, so we can create a security policy as any other, um, it's in markdown. So uh, let's create it, and now it should end up in uh, to our repository. This is how it looks like. We can even look at, for example, um, at um, how, uh, for example, how uh, how the security policy looks like for um, SPNet Core. So they have a security policy, and you should email secure at Microsoft in case you encountered a security issue. Any questions regarding security policies? No. Nope. If not, let's continue. Um, so what happens next after you, you reported an issue? Well, you could use the security advisories, which is a private space where you can test and resolve the security issues. What happens when you get an issue is that you will create a draft security advisory where you fill in a security level, a CVE identifier, which stands for common vulnerabilities and exposures, is an ID for the issue. Um, then you can, uh, it's a sort of private environment where you can invite your trusted people, probably the researchers that reported the issue that they might help you in solving it. Um, you can create also a private fork 
to solve an issue and then obvious when the issues are resolved then you can publish the advisory and you can encourage um, the ones that are using your packages package to to upgrade so let's take a look at how how this looks like in um, in um, in github uh, let's go back to our repository So again, under the security tab, we have security advisory. So we create a new draft and then we can specify a version. And we can, we can choose a package name. We can choose, for example, which um, ecosystem it is. We can select the severity and a, we can choose a CV identifier. So let's create this one. So you can uh, add users or teams. You can publish it or you can start a temporary private fork to investigate the issues. Hmm? Do we have any questions until now? No. Okay. Oh, we, we just got one here uh, from Christine here. Is CV just a random number or should it be something specific? Well, it has a certain pattern. It starts uh, with CV year and a, uh, a number, a five, six digit number. If we look at these uh, security issues that uh, the um, uh, white source bolt uh, discovered, they follow the same format. For example, the security um, issue was discovered in 2016 and has this number. So it's, it's sort of unique identifier for your security issues, for your security issue. So Luna says here that there's a CVA database that you register your CVs in and get the number. So you centrally organize and you get the number back that you can use. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, so let's continue. So uh, to wrap up, do we have any questions? Uh, more questions? Do you feel like we're missing anything in this? Is there some tool you'd like or some part of the chain that you've been talking about so far that you would like security tools in? Or do you think it works pretty well with the tools we have? Well, it, uh, there are a few tools on the market that uh, can be used. For example, it, there, are, there are already anchor scans for image vulnerabilities. Um, and then there are for other stages. Um, tools available on the um, on the marketplace. For example, uh, we can use OWASP. Um, OWASP ZAP or baseline scan. Um, and uh, yeah, these ones have to be used with responsibility. So you don't scan any anything that you're not allowed to scan. Uh, so there are a few tools that can be used and integrated uh, with our workflows. Um, I, even if GitHub doesn't have doesn't yet have all the security features that are needed, and I'm sure that they, they will come soon. But there are other alternatives out there on the market that can be used until then. Yeah, and I guess you can build your own without a problem as well to get, build your own tools and publish here as well if you have good good ideas. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So do we have any questions from the audience? I think we have still have about 10 minutes to go if needed. Otherwise, could you switch to the last slide, please, Mihai? Uh, yes. So thank you for a real interesting presentation. And as I said earlier, we will post this on LinkedIn and on the meetup event we have. And if you want to look at future events, we have both our Solidify homepage 
we have the Swedish ALM and DevOps meetup and also on LinkedIn. Uh, next event we have is probably going to be GitHub Codespaces. Matthias, do you have any, or probably we have decided so far, but do you have, do you have any things you want to say about the next event, Matthias? Uh, not more than uh, that's the the working uh, idea. So uh, so to have a look at how you can improve your local development with things that code spaces bring to the table. Um, but it is still in in private beta, so we'll have your private preview. So we're just uh, making sure we we can uh, can uh, can do proper demos of this. Thank you, Matthias. And as I said earlier, if you have any, 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 any other ideas about topics connected to GitHub, please let us know. If you need help working with GitHub, we would really like to help you. Or if you need help migrating to GitHub, we can help you with that as well. So we are all in for this. But if we don't have any other questions, you will have uh, 10 minutes to do something else. Maybe have a quick lunch or stretch your legs or have a coffee. And uh, thanks for coming here today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.